Um, but for now, we have just an amazing group of panelists who have really been building at from all angles of the fundraising land, the digital fundraising landscape. Um, so we have the wonderful Zoe here to moderate the panel and Kelsey from Change Gallery, Eric from Art Blocks, Alicia from Give Pact, um, Zoe with the Giving Block. If you want to come up and we'll get all of this started and and to share a little bit about some of the strategies um, you know that's carried the movement through the bull but hopefully the way that we can really be applying that as a community even in these these quieter times so really excited for this one um, and as always please drop your questions in the q a we encourage you to hop in the chat and we'll be dropping the telegram link to continue conversation Awesome. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. So thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you have enjoyed everything so far. I know it's been super amazing, but I'm excited to talk about something which is near and dear to my heart, which is NFTs. Um, my name is Zoe, in case you didn't catch that. I manage Web3 partnerships for the Giving Block. Um, you know, at the Giving Block, we help nonprofits accept crypto donations. But something we are very focused on, as I think everybody who's joining me today is, is bridging that gap between nonprofits and the Web3 space. And that is 100% my role. I'm, you know, focused on NFTs and DAOs and kind of the nitty gritty of Web3. So I am really excited to talk with our guest today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves as well as their you know, backgrounds and their orgs. Um, Kelsey, do you want to go ahead and kick us off um, and, and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Great to see you, Zoe. Um, great to see everyone on this call. It's super exciting for us to all get together in kind of space and, and you know, trade secrets and, um, you know, just get the community together. So thank you so much, Endowment for and, and the Giving Block for pulling this together. Um, it's an honor to be here. My name is Kelsey Driscoll. I am the Chief of Staff for Change Gallery. So um, if any of you for, were here for the last panel, um, I work with David All for with Change Gallery. Um, and we're an NFT marketplace for social change, for change makers. Um, and I serve as our chief of staff, um, meaning I coordinate our contributors. I work one on one with our NFT artists, and I also work one on one with brands um, and as well as uh, nonprofits um, to create uh, really successful NFT campaigns. Um, I am also the uh, lead strategist at Upbring Innovation Labs, uh, where I lead our Web3 strategy, and we have we are a child welfare nonprofit uh, in Texas, and we have worked closely with Change Gallery as well as the Giving Block um, and Endowment in many of our uh, fundraising efforts. So I am not only a practitioner from the technical side with Change Gallery, but um, I am also a nonprofit practitioner myself doing fundraising. Um, so I kind of come to this space from both lenses. Uh, so happy to be here, excited for this conversation. Um, yeah, on to who? On to the next. Amazing. So glad you could join us. Uh, Eric, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Eric. I'm the founder of our blogs. I'm an artist in the NFT ecosystem. Uh, and uh, just a, a person that's always kind of really held uh, charitable giving dear to my heart. And uh, just, you know, I think there's a really interesting story from being able to be in a position to give 10, 15, 20 bucks a year to specific organizations to kind of just like the way that things have happened over the last few years in this ecosystem and, and being able to put my, not just myself, but also a lot of other people in a position to be able to um, gift uh, significantly more meaningfully. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, I, I'm very honored to be you know, here with uh, the other people on this call. They're making huge changes and in, 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 in huge impact in this ecosystem. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to want to, like, kind of be able to support charitable organizations. It's another thing to make it easy and seamless and uh, painless. And uh, I, I don't think that the landscape would look the way that it looks today if it wasn't for the other people on this call. So I just also want to take a moment to thank everybody here uh, that, that I get to share this stuff. Amazing. And last, but very much not least, uh, Alicia, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Hi, everyone. I'm Alicia Mall, the CEO and co-founder of GivePact, a crypto fundraising platform for nonprofits. Um, what can I say? I've been fundraising in the capacity um, since President Obama's 2012 campaign, um, became a staffer at MSNBC in the news space, and then for the last seven, eight years have led efforts at the Innocence Project, where we get people out of prison who are wrongly convicted. Uh, my co-founder and I, Steve, who are friends from undergrad, saw the potential and the generosity of Web3, and we said we don't want to leave our clients behind, so let's let's make it frictionless for them to benefit um, and be a hub to get them onboarded and um, do it in Web3 fashion. So GivePact uh, is here for you all. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alicia, for joining us. So something that I always love to hear is a bit of background on how people entered the Web3 kind of world. It's so new and so chaotic that, you know, a lot of these stories are pretty recent, but I do always love to hear, you know, what was that inception point for people? You know, what was that first moment where they first heard about crypto or first heard about NFTs and how did they end up you know, in this uh, chaotic wild west uh, that we are today, you know, how did that journey create, you know, who you are today? Um, Kelsey, do you want to go ahead and start off? I'd love to hear, you know, what was your kind of origin story, your superhero origin story for Web3? Uh, I don't know about, about superhero, but I appreciate the, I appreciate that characterization. Um, so I actually, I spent the first 10 years of my career in DC working on social impact strategy across sectors. So orgs would tell me I want to create this impact and I would work with them to figure out the best way forward, including what tech to use. So I consulted with the likes of Department of Defense, Department of State, World Bank, Federal State Council. Um, so I have been aware of blockchain for years, but never really dove into it until I got to Upbring Innovation Labs. So we're part of a larger uh, legacy child well-being nonprofit called Upbring. Um, and my main job is to figure out new innovative ways to advance our mission, which is to break the cycle of child abuse. So when NFTs hit mainstream in 21, um, and I say hit mainstream, the big people sale, right? Um, I basically came to the space seeing if there was a there there for nonprofits um, and fell down the rabbit hole, right? Realizing the true value of decentralization, what good can, can come from um, creating more access, inclusion, and, and economic empowerment, uh, when we kind of reimagine what our current financial systems look like. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I dove down that rabbit hole, and then I found Ch Change Gallery. So they were in the very, it was back when we were changed out, they were in the very nascent stages of what is this going to be? What are we building here? Um, and I came in as kind of a social impact expert to say, you know, this is how nonprofits can play. This is how they can't at the stage and time. Um, and then I just fell in love with the team and the mission and the space and the ethos really um, of, you know, Web3 OGs. And I stuck around and started to realize the good that can come from innovating in a space that's once so nascent, we keep saying it, and we're going to keep saying it until it's not, we're still early. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted Upbring to be at the table um, early and through Change Gallery, um, I'm, I'm really passionate uh, about different types of stakeholders and sectors having worked across multiple um, to be here at this stage, to help build it at this stage. Uh, because all of the people that and populations that we represent, right, in, in my world, it's, it's child welfare, um, and it's also just broadly change makers, right, from the change gallery perspective, how do we arm them with what they need, the tools they need to succeed in this new emerging economy? Um, and so once I bought into that, I was, I was down the rabbit hole, and that was like two and a half years ago now. Um, <laughs> So that was a little bit of my journey. It's not as traditional. I actually came in through the through the nonprofit research space. Eric, Artblocks is obviously one of the biggest names in the space. How did you get involved with Artblocks and what was your kind of uh, entry point for Web3? Well, uh, gosh, there's a lot there. So my entry point to Web3 was 2017, 2016, 2017. Um, uh, just kind of after years of hearing about Bitcoin from my brother, actually, 
I just kind of fi- finally going down the rabbit hole uh, on December 31st, 2016, I, I think I had 0.2 Bitcoin and I, I just had this like crazy desire to own a whole Bitcoin. And that was kind of like where I've never looked back when it got into NFTs. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Ethereum ecosystem before uh, the launch of CryptoPunks, but like understanding this idea of being able to like execute things smartly using smart contracts just kind of blew my mind completely. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I built a smart contract one time to kind of secure uh, a, 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 a best friend of mine had a, had a baby and I wanted to gift them something. So I put 10 ETH in a smart contract, which at the time was worth less than a hundred bucks and, and locked it for 18 years. Right. And it's just like the, the ability to just like for a, I'm not a programmer. I've always, I've always dabbled in code, but I'm not a professional to be able to lock something in place and to be able to make money smart. I thought was just like incredibly fascinating. Uh, anyways, fast forward 2017, I uh, uh, claimed crypto bucks because at the time, if you were in the ecosystem at the time, you just found like if you were excited about the technology, you would just kind of find reasons to use the technology and got really excited about any reason to use the technology. But at the same time, I've been uh, creating generative art and code-based art for a few years at that point. And there was just like this beautiful intersection of a generative project using this technology that I was falling in love with. Um, and um, the, with our block specifically, it, the idea for our blocks was born exactly as I was claiming CryptoPunks, but it's something that had kind of been building for a really long time. And the idea to kind of uh, allow generative artists to release. Uh, initially, it was meant to be interactive and immersive work, but um, just any any kind of visual output created with code in a way that really couldn't be done effectively, um, uh, like in a digital sense, uh, in a streamlined sense beforehand. So uh, what we have today is just this kind of hobby that came from 20 years of just kind of thinking and tinkering and and desiring for things to happen a certain way. And uh, what what our blocks is today is, is way beyond my expectations of what I ever thought it could be, but it is, um, yeah, it's just this, 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 uh, this beautiful thing that just demonstrates the power of the technology that we're operating on, the, the passion behind these artists that are uh, participating in the ecosystem and uh, kind of something that I guess was unexpected, just as it was unexpected for the, our blocks platform to have the success that it did was the ability to um, also support charitable organizations at such a massive scale. Uh, it de- definitely never in my life would you have told me a year before launching our blocks that we hit, we, we would have been able to make such an impact. Uh, and I say we by all the artists that participate in the platform, but it happened and it's uh, it's a really good feeling. And it's just, it, again, it's a demonstration of how powerful and incredible this technology that we have uh, really is. And of course, I need to know the Web3 origin as well as the nickname origin for Biggie Malls. I love that so much. <laughs> Biggie Malls is my DJ name. Um, that's all I can say. It's my, 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 you know, Biggie Smalls. My last name is Malls. Um, and we're give underscore packed for the business. Um, I would say that I've been driven in my career to use technology, to use the Obama style and MSNBC, you know, the high level, well-funded tech to really push the causes that need our help the most. In the height of the last bull market, I took a control of our assets, of, of my own personal assets and started, started invest, you know, looking at my assets and saying, how can I learn stocks and options and trading? And then crypto was popping off. And would go back and forth with my co-founder, Steve, and I was working on a death penalty case at the time. And I saw the quick accumulation of cash and DAOs. I saw the quick organization and mission-driven purpose of DAOs and then the reward system of NFTs. And I was like, how do we use this energy? I was working on a project called Abolition Now to be sort of the digital hub to end the death penalty. And I was like, how do we use this energy and bring it over here to end the death penalty? Um, Which is ridiculous that, yes, the U.S. still um, in the majority of states, or I think it's abolished in 23 states, so the majority of states still use um, capital punishment to execute. So I said, you know, go back and forth. And Steve said, well, that's great, but I see this bigger opportunity here for all of our clients beyond mass incarceration. So that is the origin of, of Give Pact. We wanted to make sure our clients can get left behind and then identify that the majority of them have no way to participate in the economy. So let's do it. And yes, there are excellent, um, uh, we have excellent colleagues, endowment and, and giving block leading the way. There's room for us and let's do it um, in the way we see meeting nonprofits and the industry where they're at. So that is the genesis of Give Pact. 
an iteration after lawyer after chatting with lawyers and seeing the challenges of the legal you know obviously it started like this and it, you know now we're laser focused with with legal support um and the state of crypto in the US amazing eric nfts have you know proven to be one of the most powerful vehicles for community fundraising and even with the decreased volume from the market, we're still continuing to see support for nonprofits from the space. Um, you know, I myself am very focused on NFT fundraising, so I can personally attest that we have still seen quite a few new and existing projects that are finding ways to, you know, support causes they care about. What do you think makes NFT communities so willing to be, you know, generous or, um, you know, kind of open towards charitable impact, um, even during a market downturn? You know, I think I think it's culture. I mean, I think culture. You know, we have this constant conversation about royalties in this space. We have this constant conversation about charitable giving in this space, and a lot of the things that drive those things are culture and. You know, there's there's a lot of inequalities in our space, just like there are in the traditional art world. But there's there's an opportunity here with a new nascent technology for every single person that's a leader in this space. And leaders can be founders, they can be people that work on teams, and they can also be artists and the people that are creating uh, the narrative of what's happening. There's an opportunity for every every time there's like a major revolution in technology for people to like change the way things are and to and to make uh, a difference and to and to focus on what those things that were in the past that could be made better. And some of those things might be made better organically. And some of those things have to be made better a little bit more intentionally. And I think ultimately what that means is that there, I, I believe that we are at least from within the artist community, because a lot of the charitable giving, a significant portion of the charitable giving comes as a result, at least with the Arblox ecosystem of an artist designating a portion of their proceeds of the sale to go directly to a charity, which is facilitated by the beautiful organizations that are, building and working with lawyers to make it work uh, on the other side. Um, and that that culture, I think, comes from a lot of different things. I think one of the things is the, the artists are more aware in general. I think artists are aware and a little bit more in tune with society and with like the needs of our, our uh, of our world. Um, I also think that, you know, the, um, the, the you know, the kind of intense and, and crazy amounts of money that were transferred especially in 2021 and partly in 2022 contribute to an artist's desire to say, Hey, look, like, yeah, I'm, I'm a badass artist and I want to make all this money, but like there is a level to where it becomes excessive. And um, you know, you can just take that money in, but you also understand that like in this ecosystem, you are under the most high level of scrutiny at every step that you take. When you release an artwork in this ecosystem, you are now essentially a public figure and you are now, um, uh, every single step, everything you do is looked at, and people are like, "Oh man, you're you, you know you're making all this money. You should you owe me more time in the Discord or whatever it might be that this ecosystem kind of demands of you." And I think one of the ways that the artists can have a little bit of rest, a little bit of peace, is by saying, "Hey, look, like you know, there's this opportunity. Yes, I can make all. I mean, the artist has the choice; they can make this money, but instead they realize that there's an opportunity to." to channel some of these funds in towards a charitable organization, the person buying the artwork may or may not know or care that they're, uh, that part of the proceeds are going to a, a charitable organization. Uh, I think that there are, there are many people that do make purchases based on the idea and the knowledge that their, that their funds will go towards like a, a good cause. But oftentimes it's really just the culture of the platform and it's the culture of the artist, um, uh, be, you know, and, and, and keeping that culture moving forward. And one of the things that, that's changed significantly, obviously, is the volumes in the ecosystem. Um, but like knowing that artists continue, even with the lower volumes, hey, look, these artists still have the same costs of producing their work, whether it's their time, whether it's, you know, whatever resources they have to spend on kind of putting the work out there. And so they're making significantly less revenues, but they're still dedicating percentages of their drops to charity because uh, there's a culture in place to do so. And, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, within the art blocks ecosystem, if there's a hint of an art project that's being released without charitable contributions like you know this pushback like i don't think any artist uh you know should ever feel ashamed or or whatever of doing uh, whatever they want to do but like it has become such an ingrained part of our culture that if a project in art blocks is announced uh, especially a curated project without a charitable component people are reaching out to me and be like hey what's going on with this project and i think that uh you know it it, it has led to uh this kind of almost uh assumption or expectation that 
things within this ecosystem um, at least have a very good chance of being able to make charitable contributions. And I think, uh, you know, we, we have to fight for that and we have to make sure that that remains kind of the status quo. But again, this is where we have an opportunity as founders, as artists to make that change and to establish the status quo for what this looks like going forward. And uh, there, there's been charity in the arts for many years. Oftentimes it comes from the patrons. Oftentimes it comes from the artists. But in this case, really, the artists are driving that. And uh, yeah, there's just there's a lot of beauty in kind of like the conversation that that comes from after that. We've talked a bit about kind of this, you know, cultural advantage to these growing Web3 communities and how interconnected they are and how much kind of, you know, responsibility and, and respect there is within them. But I'd love to dive a bit into, you know, some of the measurable wins and, and stats we've seen so far. Um, Kelsey, I think you would be a great person to talk about that, um, you know, you guys have a huge kind of heads down and build attitude. I'd love if you could talk a little bit about the results of that and you know how you guys maintain that uh, focused attitude. Yeah, I'll start with that part of it, right? Um, the, the focused attitude part of it. Um, many of you might not know, but Change Gallery is one of the only independent marketplaces. We haven't had VC funding. We've had no angel investors. We're all pretty much volunteers on the team still. Um, and I think a big reason that we've maintained our momentum without every single person being paid, you know, as like a grassroots movement um, is, is because we're all change makers. Um, to Eric's point, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, <laughs> people who have, who, have, who have stayed particularly through this bear market and who have continued building through this bear market believe in the ethos of Web3, believe that this this technology can be life-changing, um, system-changing, um, and want to be the ones that bring that to light. And so um, as far as how do you keep it going, how do you keep building throughout it? I mean, my goal as chief of staff is always to create um, a fun, inspiring, safe sandbox. The space changes so rapidly if anyone on this call is waiting for it to slow down before they jump in, it's not going to happen. Um, so you need to find the places where you can experiment and learn and build um, both products and relationships and knowledge, right? Like all of those things. And so my goal as chief of staff for Change Gallery, is, particularly for our contributors, but also for our change makers, our, our customers, our collectors, everything is to create that safe sandbox for those conversations to keep um, continuously pushing the culture forward. Um, and our goal, as far as measurement goes, which is super exciting, um, we in the last, I believe in the last like six months, released this thing called Change Grid, which is a framework. And I think we're going to go over it later, but it's um, a framework for pulling projects together and for measuring your impact of those projects. So at Change Gallery, we've created um, smart contracts that uh, actually mark down on chain um, what SDG, what UN Sustainable Development Goal, uh, that that NFT project is going towards. So that, that there is a record immutably on the, on the Ethereum blockchain for however long the Ethereum blockchain exists um, of that participation and how it fits into these other traditional language models. So um, I say traditional language models, meaning the international development world, the nonprofit world. We all know about the sustainable development goals. We've been around, we've heard that a bunch, but we haven't heard it in the NFT space yet. And so... Um, I think one way as well that we've kept up momentum is really reaching across sectors and bringing people with us, right? Like that, that, that's how movements start. That's how grassroots movements happen. Um, it, it's keeping that energy, keeping that momentum and ensuring that you're always keeping that safe space for growing together um, because that's the only way this space is gonna, is actually gonna mainstreamify, so to speak. Um, so as far as measurement goes, we uh, we build a, a few different types of measurements into our smart contracts so that that is immutably on chain and we can see it from end to end. Um, and then as far as keeping us motivated through the bear, as I said, just um, one, creating spaces for our contributors and our builders, but also creating spaces for artists, change makers, right? We have telegram groups, things like that. Uh, we have a spaces every week that we do. Um, you know, keeping that conversation going and seeing how we can support others in the space in events like these, 
um, that we have these large convenings and, and so that we can all be telling our stories together. So I think I've answered your question. <laughs> You killed it. Thank you so much. I mean, <laughs> I would love to hear, you know, you mentioned we'll talk about Change Grid later. Let's jump right into it, if that's cool with you. I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, what Change Grid is um, and, you know, SDGs and all those fun acronyms there, if you're uh, willing to dive into it. Absolutely. And I want to, um, I'm going to throw this link I hope no one minds. I got you, Kels. Oh, you got it? Okay. Yeah. Um, because I'd love to be able to have people look at the visual as well as I talk through this. Mm -hmm. Um, so Change Grid is a framework. Um, it's it's basically a canvassing tool, it's a planning canvas to organize projects and kind of illustrate the role of each stakeholder in a successful NFT campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, so we launched Change Gallery and we were like, people know what to do. They don't. If you're trying to bring in disparate actors into a space that speaks a completely different language, each of those actors doesn't know what their role is, what they're supposed to do to make that a successful campaign. And so we put a framework together called the Change Grid um, to, to visualize what a successful campaign looks like. And so in that, um, I don't know if, if she sent it or not. There it is. That medium article. So people can kind of go so along with us here. Um, so yeah, we, there, there's four different sectors in, in a change grid. And you have the artist or the individual or the social impact organization or the what we call the change maker, um, who's creating the NFT, who's creating the NFT art. Um, then you have the, the nonprofit organization, or we also put non-governmental organization because nonprofits isn't a isn't exactly a, a global term. Um, you have the cause, right? You have the cause that is providing the social impact and that uh, adding that direct service element to the story. Um, then you have like brand philanthropy um, and that can look a, like a few different things. ESG and DEI, so environmental social governance factors, diversity, equity, inclusion factors. These are things that corporate social responsibility, brands, organizations, companies are talking about all the time, we have provided a way to put it in a smart contract on chain so that you can see and measure um, the impact that you make. Um, so that's how brands kind of fit into the story or even deaths, right? Um, and then you have culture and goals. So that's area of change, the UN SDGs, what movement this is part of. Um, and at scale, we want all of these to kind of fit together in one web, right? Because no movement exists in a silo. There's lots of crossover. There's lots in many Venn diagrams there. And so, as I said, we put all this together so that it's clear um, to each different stakeholder what their role is in the campaign um, and what their role is in making social impact. I think there's a misconception that only nonprofits do social impact. Every single stakeholder with, within a community creates social impact, be it the artist or the brand or, or the cause. Um, this is just a canvas to show you how they can all work together using this new technology, um, you know, an, a smart contract or an NFT. Rad, rad, rad. Let's get into the future. You know, we're talking about these kind of amazing, you know, revolutionary changes, things like change grid and these new frameworks exactly for looking forward. We're seeing, you know, so many new techs, so much fast speed, so many new people entering the space. We're seeing these greatest wealth transfers, all these kind of amazing earth shattering changes that are going forward. I'd love to kind of see from all three of you what's something you're most excited about or most hoping to see either from you know tech and web3 or just from the community in the future um alicia we'll start with you what's your kind of hope for the future here what's something that you know you're not seeing right now that you're hoping to see out of web3 well i just want to start with you you know you you, you mentioned the some stats that i don't think we've shared which is what we're coming into in the next couple of decades. Number one, there's gonna be $84 trillion transferred from our parents' generation, baby boomers, uh, to Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. So not only are do we have our own personal wealth and growth of crypto, but now but we also are gonna inherit 
um, this amount of money. So it's good to think about the future um, combining the power both of fiat and Web3. Um, and then with that, the, 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 the NFT market forecast is going to continue to grow in the billions. So um, if we, you know, if we continue to put a little bit of money toward the causes and center the causes that we care about, that's going to go a long way um, in this future uh, wealth generation. Um, so I would say is more nonprofits or social impact engaged, uh, Web3 being a leader in philanthropy and showing corporate America uh, what we're really about, which is it's fundamental. And, you know, Eric, I love that you said culture, because I think in order for giving and philanthropy to be successful, it has to be more than monetary. It's got to be lifestyle. It's got to be culture. It has to be center and not an afterthought, not a check at the end of the year for tax purposes, but what's becoming monthly givers and having relationships with organizations that's beyond monetary. So that's what I'm looking forward to is us as a community showing people how um, what this technology is about, which is fundamentally grounded in social impact, community transparency, and giving back. Thank you so much for that insight. And yes, I love that, you know, kind of culture lifestyle focus as well. So I'm going to throw it back to you, Eric. What's something that you're not seeing right now from the space that you're hoping to see in the future? I mean, as a as a artist, as a founder, as a collector, I think just regulatory clarity on all the levels on everything that you know kind of involves everything from social impact to just like tax, um, and and just kind of like what the future what the future is. It's like you know we we're in a we're in a position where we have this beautiful technology that we can use to do all these really fun things, and we're always under attack. It feels like generally from um, you know the, the 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 powers that be, and that, you know I think. It's just it's just so interesting to think that like you know from uh, there 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 was a year uh, I mean actually just like over the course of the last five years the amount of taxes for example that I personally paid the government to feel you know kind of not forget about being under attack just feeling this level of uncertainty like what is the future of this art that I'm doing what is this future of this of this platform that we brought together these artists that have been able to quit their jobs because they get to pursue art full time like that is a positive thing in our society they've been able to contribute millions of dollars to like charitable organizations. That is a positive thing in society. And the fact that we go through all of that and we see all this positive stuff, but like a couple uh, bad actors can, can, can really kind of like tarnish that and, and, and put it in a, in a, in a negative eye is infuriating. It keeps me up at night. And it's just, um, that's, you know, just getting a little bit of clarity would go such a long way to be able to just, I mean, I'm here for the long run. I don't need renewed conviction, but I, I, I do need, I guess, like every now and then just a, uh, a, uh, I don't know, a little bit of support there. So yeah, getting some clarity would go a long way. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of, uh, you know, back in school where uh, even with strict teachers, it was a little bit better as long as you knew what you were getting into, you know, what the test was going to be on and what was expected. Uh, where you really ran into trouble is where, you know, the expectations were unclear and things were kind of constantly changing. Um, not to put everything back in the light of school, but that does seem to be where my mind goes often, including in my, you know, dreams and things like that. Moving on, Kelsey, what's something you're hoping to see from the space in the future? So, um, technologically, um, I'm really excited about the mass adoption of L2s and just the, I think it's key to mainstreamification, you know, and, I, and I'm really excited for, for what that means, right? Because it's going to open the floodgates. I, I agree with regulation, right? As soon as we de-risk the space for nonprofits, they're going to feel, and all actors are going to feel more comfortable um, coming in and playing. And it's going to be our responsibility as stewards of the space to be able to, to teach them to play in a responsible way, right? Um, but as far as culturally goes, you know, I, I'm just, we need to tell a better story and I'm excited for us to start to tell that better story. We have, we've spent, and we, we are spending this bear building. A lot of us are really cool stuff. And I'm, I'm excited to bring that to light. You know, we need to get past the kind of like PFP 10 K generative 
ape stage and we need to get into how does this apply across all sectors? What about public services? What about nonprofit services? What about supply chains? What about identification? Like blockchain and NFTs specifically have use cases in all of these and they're starting to be um, explored. So I'm excited for these, for cross-sector collaboration um, as this, um, as we come to light. And I think that requires us all to be, um, you know, to work together in spaces like these to tell these really impactful and engaging and captivating stories for those audiences or for the next generation to onboard this next generation of crypto. So I know we're a little short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead to perhaps one of the kind of most important topics I wanted to touch on today, which is strategy for nonprofits. One of the biggest challenges nonprofits face today is courting donors from younger generations. A lot of those traditional methods of fundraising are falling flat or not reaching younger people at all. How can participating in Web3 help nonprofits tackle this challenge? Um, Alicia, we'll go to you, and uh, I'd love to hear from everybody, but we'll start with you. Well, I think you, you need to make yourself accessible. So, you know, work with one of our platforms to um, make it accessible because you're losing out on, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Open it up. Um, as you get comfortable with it, explore NFT collaborations. Um, and then I would say this is not really Web3 focus, but I think the two strategies and tactics that we need to focus on are growing mobile, growing monthly donations, and hire a Gen Zer to run your TikTok. Because um, that's where the talent is at. I can't do it. Hire a Gen Z. I can only do Instagram. So it's, I really want to see more TikTok uh, Web3 takeover. Maybe there is, but I don't, I guess I don't, I'm not on TikTok enough to know. So those are a few tactics. Um, and then remember, fundraising is a, a, a yearly activity. Don't um, try to diversify your fundraising beyond um, end of year and giving Tuesday. Try to create some other key dates, um, deadlines help, and people are always motivated by that. Kelsey, what's something you would suggest to a nonprofit by utilizing Web3 for, um, you know, courting younger donors? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I like to zoom out for this question because nonprofits are always like, we are going to where donors are. We already do that, right? Like Web1 if you're trying to get um, a baby boomer to donate, you send them a direct mailer. <laughs> That's what happens, right? Like you send a direct mailer or you send like an email and, and that's what they respond to. Um, when that changed and Web 2 came about and then we all went to social media because all Gen X and millennials were on social media. So nonprofits went to social media. We all now have Instagrams and Facebooks and, and all of that, right? Well, the next generation is going to Web 3. It's where they can own stuff. If they own the majority of stuff, right? Like that, that's what they're using. So it just makes absolute sense that nonprofits would then go to Web3, right? Go to where they are and what they're doing. Um, I say this a lot, I'm going to say it again, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if you're going into Web3, don't go in with Web2 tactics. Don't go in cocky, <laughs> like meet people, build relationships, lasting relationships that are not just money, please, but are... <laughs> people who care about your mission and continue the conversation, as Alicia said, throughout the whole year. Um, and we did this with, so I, I introduced um, our entire Web3 strategy for Upbring, and we're a traditionally like traditional legacy nonprofit. We're over 100 years old. Um, and we started with low-hanging fruit and said, hey, can we accept crypto donations? And then they got comfortable with that. They started to understand blockchain a little bit more. And then we could start to innovate around it. Um, and throughout that entire process, I was in Web3 culture making relationships, building relationships, helping build, understanding technology at its base layer. And I think that every nonprofit should do that. This is the new generation of the internet. Skill up now because um, you're going to have to pay for it later anyway. Um, so yeah, I would say jump in, get curious and find your safe sandbox, which every organization here has a safe sandbox to play in. 
um, and, and has trusted stewards of the space to talk to you. So start discovery. Um, I would say start with low hanging fruit, just getting crypto enabled to be able to accept a crypto donation if someone wants to give it to you. Um, and then start building those lasting relationships and keeping that conversation going. Just like during the year with your traditional donors, maybe you send a newsletter or an impact report or whatever, do that, do the same thing with your Web3 donors. Um, they want to be part of your story. Eric, I'd love to hear from an artist's perspective, um, you know, what you kind of have to say on this question about, you know, diving into Web3 for nonprofits and courting younger donors. Yeah, well, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things. First of all, I just want to expand on what Kelsey said. Um, the Web3 space is a very, I mean, it's huge, but it's a very close knit community. And uh, if you just kind of put yourself, you're a nonprofit, you come with like a good, you come with a good purpose, um, but you have to really kind of take a step back and realize that like for the last two and three years, we've seen brands entering the space and before they even do anything, like they literally buy uh, an NFT and they make it their PFP. And like the whole crypto industry is like, Oh my gosh, here comes another like money grab. Here comes another. And, 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 and there's this sentiment within our ecosystem, like, you know, people see a lot of money here. So people are going to come after our money. And I think um, the, there are many brands that have executed so seamlessly, like their entrance into Web3, because they haven't followed a playbook that a couple early brands did that maybe found success that looked like success, but actually it's just because they came in in 2021 and people would have bought anything at that time. And so I think it's just really critical to understand, you know, kind of what Kelsey was saying, like you, you need to be a part, of, you need to be a participant in this ecosystem, uh, in my opinion, otherwise, it, 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 if you really kind of want to have a meaningful impact and, and meaningful um, uh, uh, benefits from it, just like the brands that are wanting to come in, just like new artists that want to come in. I get a lot of artists that reach out They're like, how do I get into Web3? I'm like, A, take your time, calm down, like, do not do this for the money because people can smell that a million miles away. But instead, it's like, hey, make yourself at home, get to know who the people are, who are the good people, who are the bad people? There are a lot of bad people in Web3. You know, it's one thing for a brand to get involved with bad people in Web3. It's a whole nother thing for like a non non-profitable or chair non-profit or a charitable organization to get involved with like the wrong people in Web3. And so it's like tremendously scary and terrifying to think like how susceptible, um, you know, kind of like the how, I don't know, how innocent everything can seem until somebody does a rug pull. And uh, we've seen uh, people raise money for good causes that have kept the money. Like there's just a lot of really weird things. And so taking your time is so important here. This isn't going anywhere. I mean, I guess regulation can screw all this up, but like, I don't think this is going anywhere. We're here. Um, and, and there is a constant sentiment within the Web3 world of people. It, imagine that like there were 10 times more people active in this space than there are today, just two years ago. So there's a dwindling of the number of people that are active in the ecosystem. There is a dwindling eventually of the funds that there are to give away in this ecosystem, but there are new projects, new artists, new uh, uh, brands, and then on top of that nonprofit coming into the ecosystem, looking for uh, participation in a dwindling size pool. On top of that, you have to consider that a lot of artists, I mean, this happened to me per, uh, personally, a lot of artists got really excited about this. It feels good to give. And a lot of artists got really deep into giving and gave greatly and tremendously. And ultimately, um, the tax situation kind of caught up with them. And they realized that like, this is not as straightforward and as easy as it may be. Um, and, 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 and a lot of artists right now, I can speak for myself and a lot of artists like uh, that I'm friends with are in a tight spot right now. They're kind of suffering from how much giving they did before they realized that they're still taxed on the giving and they're still taxed on a lot of these other things. And I think people kind of, um, you know, it's easy to kind of take that for granted because you see artists making a decent amount of money. A lot of artists that I know are actually making money to pay the taxes from the year before. Like it's, it's pretty crazy because like not a lot of artists come into this ecosystem thinking that they're going to make that kind of money. And then the value of Ethereum goes down before they've sold it. And all of a sudden they owe more taxes than they made. And it's just kind of a mess. So I think it's really important to kind of keep that into consideration and also understand that like not every artist is interested in participating in a charitable thing. Just because a lot of us have set that precedent, that doesn't mean that everybody can or should. And, uh, you know, making sure that nobody ever, and I don't think this is a problem within the, within the um, charitable space, but you know, nobody ever feels shame for not participating in those things. And no one ever feels pressured. And, you know, I've, I've, I've had a really wonderful um, dialogue with Kelsey over the last couple of years. And like, you know, there were times where I was able to give a lot more and there's times where I was able to give a lot less. And it's, it's always been a very like supportive 
uh, I've never felt like unsupported by that. And I think there, uh, that's not how I felt in the past with other charitable institutions. And so, you know, just being sensitive to the fact, this is a new space. We're trying to change the world. We're trying to change the way that people do things. And, uh, we're trying to figure it out as we go. And there's still a lot to figure out. Uh, and, and, and a lot of us have made mistakes in charitable giving that have actually put us in a, in a position that puts us in like a financial predicament. So just be wary of all those things. Take your time. Um, identify people that are aligned with your causes so that they're going to be excited to give and not just giving uh, based on the fact that everybody else gives. Thank you, Eric. Alicia, I saw you had your hand up. Well, I just wanted to emphasize the point that we've all said, which is it doesn't always have to be a monetary exchange. I was at a, the classy fundraising event um, conference a couple of weeks ago, and someone says, well, how much is Gen Z giving? And I said, why do they need to give? They just made a video in millions to help stop the execution of our client. They'll give when they get money in the future, they'll give, but we're not looking for money from them because the value of taking time to do a video for advocacy purposes is invaluable. So, you know, think about ways to use NFTs to reward volunteerism. Think about um, other ways that you're, that people can contribute because the lot philanthropy is not just money, it's time. A lot of us volunteer. And so let's also think about those ways for people who don't have, you know, valuable monetary um, or, you know, aren't ready to give yet. Because right? I think giving is a mindset um, and, and we're, we want it to come at a younger age, but, you know, we'll help do that. What a great point. I love that so much. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I'm going to just pop over to the Q&A. And if anybody has any questions they want to throw in here, we're going a little bit over, um, but happy to throw a couple other questions to our wonderful panelists. Um, from Blue, um, can our panel speak about um, a utility use, uh, about utility use and a case study example where you have seen, that you've seen um, that maybe really inspires you and Definitely extra bonus points. You know, obviously there's so many amazing use cases from bull cycles, but we are in a very different market. Um, you know, maybe extrapolating strategies from that case study that you think could be applicable and applicable now or to help people prepare for that next um that next bull. Hey guys, do you mind if I start just because I'm I have a hard stop here and I just kind of want to um uh, walk into the building but i want to say first of all thank you very much for having me here and uh, in terms of utility i think utility has so many different meanings and i feel like there's um i have yet to find like really really solid use cases of utility other than feeling good and being excited about the things that you're doing and being proud of the things that you're doing and um i think that sometimes you know we index a lot on utility being additional future monetary gains or monetary support etc I think utility as a word, like I am kind of turned off by the word just in general because of the way that it's been uh, portrayed within this ecosystem. And I think it's just a scary place in a, in a you know, a, a scary situation to, to, to try to figure out, plus from the regulatory perspective, if I read what you meant by utility correctly. But, um, you know, it's, it's something that I think utility is, it can be valuable. It's just something that will be proved out well over time. And I think it's just really early right now to be thinking about uh, personally about like the utility in, in the sense of like how, what we say utility in the NFT ecosystem. I would love to hop in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Eric about just the definition of utility. It's been <laughs> kind of battered in this space of what that actually means. Um, but I would love to bring up a use case, one of the, one of the, the inaugural project on Change Gallery, and it was called Awaken Your Inner Child. And um, we, it was 27 different artists that came together, led by Brian Brinkman and Rizzle, who are also Art Blocks artists. Um, and as I said, and, and 25 other artists. And um, the project itself was, uh, they would draw refrigerator-worthy art, and then it was sold at a, at a very approachable price. I think they were $25 each. Um, and they were a blind mint, so NFT collectors got that NFT, right? And it was a surprise which one they got from like which artist or whatever. Um, so it was, it, but it was great. It sold out in 30 minutes. Um, it, there was a bunch traded on the secondary market. Um, Upbring, which was the recipient um, of primary sales and then also on secondary sales, um, 
so we we received that. We also um, that went to our crypto endowment fund for better childhoods, which is a first of its kind fund where we can actually hold our crypto. So that we built that with the giving block, actually. Um, and so you say, okay, like what was the utility for the NFT collector at this point? Well, um, the NFT collector got that NFT and could trade that NFT from any of those 27 notable artists and probably could make a profit on that back in the day or not back in the day, but back when we, when we launched, which was one utility, right? Resale value. Um, but the actual utility we were in, we were in the middle of a bear, still kind of our, um, middle of a bear. <laughs> and we started this endowment fund specifically so that we could hold it through the bear until the bull hit again. And we, we could see the inflation of those prices. Um, and then we plan to use the money that we raise that's going to sit and grow in that crypto endowment fund to reinvest in innovative projects for child welfare, like our MVP for a um, blockchain child welfare data management solution. So when we when I talk about utility within the nonprofit context, you're having a social impact on the ground in children's lives, in families' lives. Um, just by buying or trading that NFT. Because if you see where that money goes and then how it's spent, and then over time, what effect that has on the ground in your communities, to me, that's utility, that's social impact. And so Alicia's point about, you know, living your values and giving shouldn't just be this one-off thing, um, creating ways for people to, specifically NFT collectors, to engage with NFTs that are making a social impact that's what Change Gallery is about. And that's what we're facilitating is the utility being the actual social impact at the end of this. Um, now, in the more traditional aspect, we can always talk about like loyalty programs and things that um, you know are facilitated by blockchain. But I think you know, zooming out and going a level up as social impact organizations and nonprofits in this room who care about that, um, social impact is a utility. And it's a way to engage in communities that you may not have had access to had you not bought this NFT. One quick example of a project I love to speak about when I'm not talking about uh, art blocks, even though Eric left, um, is New Story. Um, in 20, at the height of, you know, when, when Ethereum was like three, above 3,000, they did a collaboration with Eric Koo, um, one house, one family forever. And if you got two NFTs or two of those designs or one of those designs for two Ethereum, it went to buying a 3D home for people in El Salvador and, and Mexico. And so I love that because that is a, a piece of art that you, you know, may or may not be inspired by, but forever you have a family that you can look to in your NFT, or if you put a photo of them in your house, that you've provided housing to someone who would, a family that would be un, otherwise unhoused. So I love that example. Um, it's a 3D house. And what's more, um, what's, you know, what's a, a better example than that housing? So shout out to New Story. And I talk about them every time. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, all right, y'all. Well, any last words before we um, kind of migrate over to a little impact story break before our impact workshop rooms? Um, what a beautiful offering and thank you all for your amazing work. Um, yeah, so we will definitely be doing a really nice little call to action packet for all of our attendees today, which will also be dropped in the Telegram if we don't have your email from the RSVP. So please, please, please stay in touch. Um, this is about connecting and obviously all of our amazing panelists are builders and, and want to get to know what you're also building. So that's why we're here. Um, I'll turn it to y'all for some closing remarks. Thank you so much everyone for joining. Um, I think one thing I always say is uh, the best way to get started is to reach out and talk to somebody. Um, I know everybody, including myself on this panel, is very open, whether it be email, social media, or through our website. We'd love to work with you. We'd love to find a way to collaborate and build. So yeah, definitely don't be afraid to reach out, even if you have you know, just a half-baked idea. Let's make something happen. Thank you all. 
stay in touch. Visit us at givepack.io. We'll be launching shortly. Um, and it's just another way for nonprofits to fundraise um, from crypto. And there'll be more offerings. And thank you all for having me. Let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's my final word. Thank you so much, Endowment, The Giving Block, everyone who has attended, um, everyone who's in the room. You can add me on LinkedIn. You can add me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is next to my uh, name up here on the screen. Um, and as Bruce just said, that they're going to be sending out some more call to action links and stuff like that. But thank you so much for taking the time, for, especially for those of you who might not know anything about NFTs yet. Please reach out. Um, Change Gallery is here to help you through that journey.